This morning's scripture once again comes from the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter. Now towards the very end of it, starting at verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Will you please join me in a moment of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The fad has long since faded away. But do you remember those magic eye puzzles? They were a product of the 1990s where some sort of brightly colored, bizarrely patterned image was shown. And allegedly... If you stared at it just right, you could see a hidden image underneath. And I have to say allegedly, because I absolutely to this day cannot see those things. Back in the day, it was such a frustrating experience. When, so, when someone would tell me that there is a hidden horse or dinosaur back there, they would awful up all kinds of terribly unhelpful advice, like just cross your eyes or just stare at one point or stare at nothing in particular. And they would say this like it is the most obvious and easiest thing to do in the world. But no matter how hard I tried, I could not see what was so obvious to others. And you could, you could tell me exactly what I'm looking for. Give me all of the instructions on how to see it. And I would stare at that picture until sunset. And I was, there's no way I am ever seeing that hidden image. For whatever reason, my brain cannot parse out the visual cues and put it all together to reveal that hidden image. Now, Magic Eyes, they were only around for a hot minute. In 1994, they were all the rage, but in a couple of years, pop culture had largely moved on. And I know I was not sad to see them go, because honestly, it annoyed me so much that I could not see them. And as, no as annoying as not being able to see a magic eye image was for me, it was really just a mild inconvenience. Considering this morning's scripture makes that a abundantly clear for Bartimaeus to not be able to see at all doesn't even begin to compare Bartimaeus knew that he was seeing, missing something important in his life and he believed that Jesus could fix it in a similar way we all have areas in our lives that Jesus can transform that Jesus can make whole However, like me with those silly magic eye pictures, we may not be able to see what is right in front of us. So we can be encouraged by this morning scripture, because if Jesus has the power to make the blind to see, then Jesus has the power to help us with our own shortcomings we might not be aware of. This means if Bartimaeus can be healed and made whole by faith, then so can we. 
In this morning's story, Bartimaeus asked Jesus for something that no one else can give him. Now, we don't know a lot about Bartimaeus. The Gospel of Matthew and Luke, they also contain a version of this story. But it's the Gospel of Mark that has the most details, including his name. We don't know if he was born blind, if he lost his sight in an accident, or if he suffered from a degenerative condition. We don't know any of the details of his life. But if he was reduced to begging on the side of the road, then we can figure out things were not going that well. We must realize Bartimaeus did not have an easy life. In the first century, there was very little work that a blind man would be allowed to do. And many in his community, they would have viewed his condition as a judgment from God due to sin. And we know this is the case because there's a different incident where Jesus heals a blind man in the Gospel of John, and that's what it's all about, if, who, who had sinned to make this man blind. So Bartimaeus would have been known to many, but he was likely ignored at best, constantly judged at worst. This means that he was likely resigned to a solitary life of begging, he had to scrap by on the begrudging kindness of strangers. Every day he had to hope that he would get enough so that he could go to sleep at the end of the day not feeling hungry. But if only he could see, he, then he could live a very different life. He would not be cut off and alone. He'd be able to work and support himself. He would be able to be a blessing for himself and to others. So of course Bartimaeus wanted to see. So that when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth, the miracle worker, was passing by, he knew this was his chance. And we get a clue that Bartimaeus had more than just a passing familiarity with Jesus. He must have known that Jesus was more than just another traveling rabbi, more than another traveling miracle worker, because Bartimaeus addresses Jesus as son of David. There is no mistaking this is a messianic title. It's a title that was reserved for the one chosen by God to usher in God's kingdom. So Bartimaeus was not just hedging his bets that this traveling rabbi could be the one who could heal him. He was declaring that he believed sight was possible because Jesus is God's chosen one. I think there are a few important lessons that we can learn from Bartimaeus. First, I think it is important to focus on what it is Bartimaeus first asked Jesus. Even though he probably wanted to see more than anything, even though sight would have vastly improved his life and fulfilled many of his wishes, Bartimaeus does not shout out, Son of David, heal me. He says, Son of David, have mercy on me. The concept of praying for mercy, that's not something we hear a lot about today, but perhaps we should. One of the oldest Christian prayers that dates back to pretty much the very beginning is Kyrie Elysian, Lord, have mercy. To ask for mercy is an acknowledgement that we have nothing to give. Asking for mercy is asking for a special privilege from a position of weakness. To ask for mercy is a confession that we are not truly deserving, but we still greatly desire or we greatly need a special kindness given upon us. To ask for mercy is the somewhat audacious request to ask for a gift, specifically a gift given with no strings attached and an acknowledgement we cannot pay it back. When we ask God for mercy, 
we should do so from a point of humbleness and reverence as we acknowledge that God is the only one capable of granting that which we ask. In an attempt to make faith more accessible, we sometimes make the error of oversimplifying things. And we often oversimplify the act of prayer down to we can ask God for what we need, and because God loves us, God will give it to us. But there is a downside to simplifying prayer too much. Because when prayer becomes all about what God can give us, then we begin to treat God like some sort of cosmic Santa Claus. Or worse, like a divine vending machine that we can always go to when we want a hit of happiness. And it's true that God does love us a great deal and that God does answer our prayers. But when we take, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, out of our prayer life, then something great is lost. When there is a need, we should take it to the Lord in prayer, but not because we deserve or think we deserve God to answer our prayer. We take it in prayer because we know that we are in need of God's mercy. If mercy is humbly asking for a great gift that we have no chance of achieving on our own, then the opposite of mercy is entitlement. Entitlement is when we believe we deserve something just because of who we are or what we are owed. If seeking mercy is based in humility, then entitlement is based in pride. Bartimaeus, he could have easily felt that he was entitled to being healed. He could have been bitter about living a lifetime with a disability he did not want. He could have demanded that he has paid his dues and it was his turn for something to finally go right. It would not be a stretch for us to imagine that he would have believed he deserved to be healed after all that he had gone through. Yet that's not how he acts. That's not what he does. His request is not one based in entitlement. It is based in hope and faith. Bartimaeus approached the Messiah by saying, Lord, have mercy on me. And Jesus, overflowing with grace and mercy, calls him over. Ask exactly how he can do that. This morning's scripture should really cause all of us to take a moment of self-reflection and ask ourselves some pointed questions. When you pray, what is the attitude you approach God with? Do you approach the throne saying, Lord, have mercy on me? Or do you approach God expecting him to give you what you feel like you should get? Now, clearly, none of us are going to go in prayer and verbally say to God, give me what I'm entitled to. But that's, it's not about the words we use. It's about the attitudes of our hearts. In our relationship with God, do we see ourselves as seeking mercy or demanding entitlements? When we approach prayer with an attitude of entitlement in our hearts, then we, then we take to God a list of our wants. However, if the, our attitude in prayer is, Lord, have mercy on me, then we are, what we are seeking is not a vain list of wants. It is the very grace of God. Bartimaeus first asked for mercy. Jesus followed up by asking, what do you want me to do? It was then he was able to say he wanted to see. When we start with mercy, then, we, then what, we, what we need, and we end up asking God, is less based on our wants and more based on what it is we need to be restored, to be healed, to be made whole. For Bartimaeus, it was clear to him that he, what he needed to be restored, healed, and made whole was to see. But perhaps it's a bit harder for us to answer that question because we may not see what it is we are missing. If Bartimaeus suffered from a form of physical blindness, perhaps we suffer from a form of spiritual blindness. Perhaps our hearts have been hardened so that we cannot see the needs all around us. 
We miss the people that God has placed in our path because we look just, we just look right past them. Perhaps just like those stubborn magic eye pictures, we cannot see what God has placed right in front of us. Historically, this has been a problem in Christianity. Even people who demonstrate righteousness and a desire to follow God can have places where their hearts were hard and they missed a chance to love the neighbor right in front of them. A good example of this is Martin Luther, the famous reformer and founder of the Lutheran Church. Many consider him, for good reason, a righteous man. The writings of Martin Luther were instrumental in John Wesley's conversion and the start of the Methodist movement. Yet Martin Luther was still imperfect. Because he wrote several books on the subject, it is well documented that Luther was a strong anti-Semite. He advocated for the burning down of synagogues and for the expulsion and even violence against Jewish people. Even someone like Martin Luther allowed hate to blind him from seeing all of God's people. Lord, have mercy. It's not just Martin Luther. Many people have a hardness in their heart and they struggle to see certain other people with compassion. I have spent years working with teenagers in some capacity. And I have met my fair share of good Christians with a, with a hardness to young people. And it hurts my heart to hear people I respect complain about the kids today. There are just too many people in too many pews who are quick to dismiss young people, complaining about how they spend too much time on their phones. They don't go outside enough. They're just too entitled to everything. It bothers me deeply when I hear people who confess to follow Jesus belittle an entire generation younger than them and dismiss them as whiny snowflakes. Friends, we cannot complain about a whole generation and then wonder why that generation wants nothing to do with church. When we refuse to empathize with young people, when we do not communicate that they belong here, that there is a seat just for them, then we miss that God loves those children just as they are. We miss the fact that young people are not the future of the church. They are the present of the church if we are willing to include them. In too many churches, instead of working to include people of all ages in age-appropriate way into the work of God's kingdom, teenagers are either shoved out or hidden in the basement. Lord, have mercy. We can be so focused on ourselves, on our own lives, that we do not see the needs in the world around us. For instance, we are, can be pretty quick to get upset when the price of gas jumps up a lot per gallon. But there is very little outrage over the fact that 2.2 billion people in the world today do not have access to safe, clean drinking water. Or the fact that every minute of every day, somewhere around the world, 21 children under the age of five die from easily preventable causes. Why, church, does our heart not break over this? Imagine if every church collectively was as passionate about ending world hunger as the average football fan is about their favorite team. We would end world hunger before the Colts made it back to the playoffs. Lord, have mercy. In this morning's scripture, Bartimaeus asked Jesus for mercy. And in response, Jesus heals him, gives him eyes to see. And Bartimaeus responds by following Jesus. In the same way, when we seek mercy, we can be made whole. We can be transformed to better be the person that God intends us to be. So may the prayer of all our hearts be, Lord, have mercy on me. May we seek 
the Lord's mercy with an attitude of humbleness, not entitlement. May we have eyes to see, hearts to love, and hands to make a difference. May we be a people who can testify to the almighty power, grace, and mercy of God by being able to proclaim, I once was blind, but now I see the Lord had mercy on me.